All right, so today we've got the Art Nouveau movement in Europe, which is a um, European variation on the arts and crafts movement. And we'll see some similarities to the both the English and especially to the American, uh, especially you see very organic architecture like we saw with Louis Sullivan's ornamentation. And the movement mostly started in Brussels in Belgium uh, in the early 1890s. And Victor Horta was uh, the main proponent or the earliest sort of proponent uh, of the style and one of its most successful architects. And we'll start by talking about the Tassel House in Brussels from 1892. So here is uh, an image of Horta looking very stylish. And uh, as I say, he was one of the first European architects to adopt this new Art Nouveau style. Art Nouveau just means new art uh, in French. And it, it refers to the idea of creating this new, more modern architecture uh, based uh, on this artistic style that is actually quite uh, organic in nature um, and um, has a lot of similarities to the organic architecture that Louis Sullivan uh, especially was promoting. And there's actually some scholarship uh, in the last few years or so that suggests that the, the initial influence of Art Nouveau occurred, came out of Chicago, and especially the auditorium building that Adler and Sullivan had done in the late 1880s, and finished in the early 1890s, and that some publications and, and presentations by uh, on that project uh, were influential to sort of spur ideas amongst the European architects that would, that would blossom into the Art Nouveau. It spread, it starts in Brussels, but it spreads and is very popular in Paris, uh, Prague, Helsinki, a number of cities uh, throughout Europe have extensive collections of Art Nouveau architecture. So here's an exterior view of the Tassel House, and you can see that it has um, this organic bay window that extends out. And it, it's sort of a mix. This one is a bit of a transitional building and that it has a, let me get my pointer. It has a, a, a pretty traditional cornice on the top that has almost a dental course that you might see even next door here. You see that dental course on the right that is more classical. This is uh, a little bit of a variation on that. And traditional stonework and an entry portal uh, with casing and lintel around it. But this bay window, and I'll have a detail for you, shows the more organic uh, designs and ornamentation that is a significant characteristic of the Art Nouveau. So here's a detail of that. And even the door casing or surround is not just flat and plain. It has a little bit of curvature to it. And when we see these columns here, especially on the bay, bottom part of the bay, we see the sort of roots, organic roots that tie the column into the stone on the bottom and leaves almost that uh, tie up to the lintel. And an interesting, you know, this is a modern architecture and they are not averse to uh, modern construction techniques. And we see the steel lintel above here fully expressed even with the rivets exposed. Uh, this is a this is an early uh, you know true expression of the the construction type that would become a, a hallmark of modern architecture in Europe. This this lecture today is kind of the origins of modern architecture in Europe as it develops, and we we see as early as 1892 this this true expression of steel construction. And then on the iron railing above that, this very organic uh, curves and forms that are, again, characteristic of the Art Nouveau. This is an interior view. And we see, again, the, the curved forms and decoration, the wall murals, the tile, the mosaic tile, flooring, and even, again, the, the iron column that has uh, a bit of an organic base, but especially at the top with the capital, explodes into this blossom of leaves and, and uh, extends out 
to tie in and connect to the, the framing all around it. So it's, it's again, taking this you know, structural form of tying the column to the various components of the beams and so forth above it and using doing that in a very uh, ornamental, decorative, organic way. Uh, perhaps Horta's most famous work is his own house, uh, the Horta House in Brussels. This is started in 1898 and finished by 1901. It's an exterior view of it that I took when I visited a few years ago. And just like the Tassel House, we see the same kind of stone exterior with a bay window and this highly decorative ornamental ironwork for a balcony and tying into the brackets supporting the stone bay window. The doorway has a number of curves and uh, ornamental ironwork in the windows for that. And a couple of details here you can see on the right, the detail of the door, even the panels below are very curved form. Uh, you, you get to a point where in Art Nouveau architecture, there's almost not a straight line in the building uh, when you get to the sort of high point or extravagance of it. There's a glass canopy over the front, and then you see the, the ornamental ironwork of the balcony railing and these columns that are supporting the bay window above that. It's very similar to the column we saw at the Tassel House. And on the interior, unfortunately, they don't allow photographs on the inside, so these are some that I found. Uh, we see, again, uh, the, the ornamental ironwork, the curved forms, almost vaulting of the ceilings and the rooms, uh, and a lot of openness, uh, just like Frank Lloyd Wright had uh, per, you know, been a big proponent of sort of open floor plans uh, and breaking away from the Victorian tendency to have small individual parlors separated by you know, solid walls, which is the doorway. Uh, we see in Art Nouveau the beginning of opening up space uh, between rooms, between levels. You know, see a certain three-dimensionality of the space here that uh, we'll, we'll see in other examples in today's lecture as well. And of course, the furniture too. We see a couple of examples here, and we'll see a few more throughout where the you know designs of cur uh, furniture also reflect this curving, ornamental, organic uh, designs. This is a view of the dining room. And again, we see these vaulted spaces lined with white subway tiles, the kind that uh, were popularized by the New York subway system and are popular in, even today, you can buy them and put them in bathrooms and kitchens and so forth. And they were quite popular in uh, the Art Nouveau era, uh, also in you know Parisian, the metro system and so forth. But this is a very unusual use of it and an early use where Instead of just putting them on the walls or in a in a you know in a bathroom or kitchen or subway, uh, here they are in a primary space like a dining room. This would this would be a very very unusual use of this material, and shows the creativity and sort of the breaking of uh, boundaries and barriers of design that our nouveau architects began that would you know continue on into the the, the modernist movement in Europe. There's another view from the end uh, uh, showing again these subway tiles in the vaulted ceilings and the, um, the curved decorative forms of the windows and the window lentils above that, as well as some of the furniture he designed. And a view at the very top of the staircase, and we see those same iron columns that he was using at Tassel House and other places and uh, uh, tying in the various uh, beams and other elements with these uh, vines or leaf forms that stretch out uh, that are very organic. And you see the murals on the wall and the curved skylight forms. So like the, here, here we have a space where almost nothing is straight and even. And I wanted to show you just a few other examples of the Art Nouveau in Brussels, uh, not specific buildings, or you don't have to know the names of these specific buildings, but just to give you a flavor of how rich this style is in Brussels. 
Uh, this is a building that's this gets the award for one of the narrowest houses uh, that you might find uh, quite vertical, but this is this is an extravagant abundance of organic ornamentation uh, with these same types of columns and uh, iron balconies and curved forms. I love that circular window at the top. Uh, just a beautiful example of Art Nouveau structure on the outside. These are taken, I took these on a, uh, when my wife and I were in Brussels a few years ago, we took a Art Nouveau tour, you know, same kinds of things you can take uh, the Chicago Architecture Foundation tours of the loop and so forth. They have an Art Nouveau tour in Brussels. So these are some of the buildings we saw. This is the view of the ground floor uh, fencing and, and stair railings. Even the stair isn't straight. Uh, it curves and meanders up to the main front level there, which is probably not an easy stair to go up and down. Here's another example. This is actually a fantastic uh, building designed uh, by one of the Art Nouveau artists that was in the building industry. Uh, he, he worked on the stucco work. And so his uh, house facade, this is his own house, and he covered his own house facade with his work of his ornamental stucco. And you see a few details, especially on the right, of uh, the quality of work that he did. It was, it was like his advertising billboard of his own work. Here's a detail up at the top of the very typical figures. Uh, we see some of the um, these rose and uh, flower patterns that we see here. These are found in the same styling that Macintosh was working with. Dard Hunter made them very popular in the United States. So uh, again, this isn't uh, this is this is the type of art and ornamentation that is typical of the arts and crafts movement, and in this case, the Art Nouveau in, in Brussels. In Barcelona, uh, the Art Nouveau is, is best represented by Antonio Gaudí, and uh, his masterpiece is La Sagrada Familia, uh, which was started uh, in 1882 and is still under construction. Uh, you've, you've probably heard of this church and, and seen it, and it's it's most famous because it uh, is still under construction. I think they are hoping to finish it uh, in the next few years uh, in time for the um, some anniversary date. Uh, it started off actually, here's a, a picture of Gaudi. It actually started off as a traditional medieval kind of Gothic revival church. And Gaudi, who was a, a fairly accomplished uh, architect in Catalonia, the region of Spain where Barcelona is, uh, he was a huge proponent of the arts and crafts movement and uh, thoroughly believed in the philosophies that uh, Ruskin or was promoting that we talked about, and uh, therefore had early on adopted this sort of medieval architectural expression and form. And that's partly how he got the commission for this new church. Uh, and they expected a traditional medieval Gothic architecture. And that's how it started out. Uh, but he soon sort of varied into the uh, art, more arts and crafts movement and, and Art Nouveau. And turned this medieval Gothic uh, style church into something completely different. And even today, uh, it, when people see this, it, it really kind of blows their minds of uh, how incredibly innovative and um, creative this is. This is uh, the view of the nativity facade. This is uh, a huge church, and this is the only, this area right here is the only part that Gaudi actually finished. Uh, he, he died in uh, the 1920s uh, in a streetcar accident. He got hit by a streetcar, sadly. And this was the only area that was actually completed. And you can see they've even been doing restoration on it. Uh, they haven't even finished the church, and they're already restoring the earliest parts of it. Off to the left here, is uh, uh, the part of the nave that is still uh, under construction. And uh, when I first visited this church in 1990, and I just realized today that it's been 30 years, uh, makes me feel very old. Uh, I was in college then. Uh, this, this part here and the opposite transit um, facade were the only parts done. None of the nave 
here and what I'll show you in a moment. None of that was done. It was just an empty uh, hole in between these two facades. And so a lot has been done in the intervening 30 years or so. And as I say, they're hoping to mostly finish it in the next, uh, within the next 10 years. So here's a better view of that nativity facade. And so uh, you know, Gaudi's take on um, Art Nouveau was, it was fairly unique, uh, almost, almost taking it to an extreme. This very much organic based. He was obsessed with the almost micro nature uh, of nature. <laughs> Sorry for that pun. Uh, you know, it would be almost if you take a seashell and you slice through it and you see that structure on the inside of a seashell or really examining how seed pods are put together. And he would express that in architectural and ornamental forms. Uh, it, it's uh, a, you can almost make out a little bit of that at the very top. They're uncovered here. Here's uh, the top right here in the middle where this tree is. It's, a, it's supposed to be almost like a Christmas tree uh, as part of this nativity facade. You can see a little bit of that. But the, the rest of the facade represents scenes from the nativity and in great detail, uh, but in a very organic stylization. Here's a few details of that. I, I kind of reference this as he, he built this thing in, in wax and, and then heated it up. And as it began to melt, he froze it. Uh, it's, it's a very uh, unique style. You can see this sort of melted, you know, dripping that looks like along the top here on the right uh, with a somewhat traditional sculptural figures here in the center. few more details of different nativity scenes, angels blowing their horns and the, the, the massacre of the innocents here, very dramatic scene. So the sculptural figures again are, are fairly ordinary. It's, it's the background that is so unusual and unique. And then these are a few views from the interior that I took a few years ago uh, to, to chance to go inside and see it uh, completed like this is, is pretty wild, uh, as I say, compared to the first time I saw it and none of this existed. So this is standing in the nave looking towards the altar and apse. And the interior uh, is based on the designs that Gaudi uh, created during his lifetime. He had created a lot of models, some drawings, some of it was destroyed in the Spanish Civil War uh, when the um, when the uh, Frank, you know Franco regime uh, you know bombed Barcelona. A number of this was destroyed, but uh, enough survived that the architects today are able to um, interpret uh, Gaudi's design. I, I wouldn't say no one would say that these are specific. Uh, creations uh, or, or reflections of Gaudi's uh, architecture or, or uh, designs. There, he more had sort of design schemes and they're sort of following and interpreting those. So it's a bit of a hybrid that could say that nativity facade is the only one that is, is pure Gaudi's work and, and true design. Uh, and this is more reflecting of his, his thoughts and, and schematic ideas. And these are, these are very abstracted trees almost where you have this heavy trunk and these sort of bulbs where branches spin out from. And then the higher you go, there's more thinner branches extending out. And it all reflects, again, this organic uh, creation of, of nature in which you know the, the trunk of the tree is the thickest and then it just out and gets thinner and thinner and thinner. And this reflects uh, the way structure works as well. At the very top, you need the least amount of structure as it spreads out. few more views. This is looking more up into the vaulting. So uh, not at all like Gothic vaulting that uh, the original uh, church committee uh, was probably expecting. If they were alive today, they'd probably be pretty shocked at what this is. And another view, this is taken from one of the side aisles and looking at the nave ceiling vaulting in the foreground and then further on are the various side aisles and you can see it it is like this abstract forest 
so he did several other projects, uh, two of which are um, worthy of, of really talking about one, two, two sort of housing complexes. The first being Casa Batio uh, from 1904 to 1906. This was a private residence with some apartments on the upper floors. It was kind of a mix where the wealthy family that hired uh, Gaudi to design their home, they um, they had their apartment, so to speak, on what the French called the premier étage or the first floor in Europe. Uh, if, if you visit Europe you and you get in an elevator, you, you might be confused because if you push the first floor, you'll actually wind up on what we call the second floor. So this is the main apartment for the Batio family. And then some of the upper facade, uh, upper floors here were apartments that they could rent out and have some income, I suppose. Uh, and up on the very top is this organic roof and are actually a roof deck hidden behind that. So here again, we see almost like the in the same vein of Horta and Brussels, this very organic architecture on the facade, the columns in this case, which are stone, are very organic in character. Uh, this is famous because of these balconies, which look uh, like uh, uh, skulls or, or um, or um, you know, almost uh, nautical um, uh, skeleton forms. Uh, the the batios. I don't know if they asked for it or if this is just what Gaudi gave them. But they had a this this building design has a very nautical theme, almost like the Ten Thousand Leagues Under the Sea. And the facade is covered in mosaic tile, uh, which is incredibly uh, creative as well. I mean, to have this uh, very abstract tile design on the exterior. Here's another nice detail of the upper facade. And you can see the tile and those sort of skeletal forms of the balconies. Detail of the main window for the Batio family. This is on the other side, as we'll see in a moment, is where their main living room is looking out over the street. And you can see the organic details of the architecture here. Not a straight line. This is where, when I was talking about the Art Nouveau in Brussels, you know, not a straight line to be found. That's, that's taken to the extreme in Gaudi's architecture. A little slow here. So here's a view of the roof deck. This is from behind the peak of the roof that we see from the street. Uh, these are some ch diff different chimney forms. I kind of uh, think of this as the the spine of a of a dragon, uh, with this spine here and the the mosaic tile are like the scales of a dragon. It's it's easy to uh, sort of fantasize in your mind when you see some of these buildings of what you're seeing. It's sort of like looking at cloud forms and and imagining what the cloud form is. And uh, it's um, a lot of a lot of creative inspiration has come from uh, Gaudi's, just looking at Gaudi's architecture. This is a floor plan of the Premier Etage. The main stair is right here where it's labeled number two, and you can even see that stair is the curved form, and you come up into an entry hall, which is number two. Uh, then there's kind of a reception room, which is item number three, and here on the far right, item four, is the main living room. And the little dotted curved lines are the reflected seal plan that you'll be able to see in a moment. Uh, then there's various other spaces uh, around an interior courtyard uh, with a stair and an elevator. This is uh, providing access to the apartments up above. And at the far left, item number one, this is the dining room. Uh, with a view into the inner courtyard. This is uh, located in the Aishampla neighborhood. We talked about that when we talked about 19th century planning and uh, of the sort of new town of Barcelona. And so this is part of this huge block with a donut hole in the middle of courtyard. So in the back of the building on the left is a view into that courtyard space. So this is a view of the staircase uh, that the tenants in the apartments up above would go up and down every day uh, with the tile on the walls and the, the very organic uh, wood and iron railing. And again, this iron uh, column and beam 
uh, again, very expressive. This is this is all cast iron with rivets and so forth, and all expressive and using the the nature of the material uh, in a very true sense. Uh, you know, I guess other than the very curved forms, which are contrived as as ornament, uh, but but expressing that and exposing it as as opposed to hiding in it in a wall and even allowing people to see the the rivets as a sort of almost decorative aspect to it. And this would uh, become less organic in the future, but that idea of expressing the structure would remain in European architecture as modernism develops. And a, a walk through the interior. So this is the entry reception hall with a uh, ingle nook fireplace, uh, unlike any that you've probably ever seen before. And the walls uh, also are uh, with plaster with this almost uh, scale-like form. Like I say, this is like being in 10,000 leagues under the sea, a very nautical underwater theme here. And a view uh, in the living room looking out the, the front bay window that we saw uh, with the uh, art glass windows like bubbles, air bubbles in the sea, and the, uh, the curved forms and even these columns inside here. This is a historic view of that. You can just sort of make out the, the sort of curved ribs of the ceiling that were shown in that floor plan uh, and the, the curved door over there on the left, some of the furniture that he designed for the Batiolo family. Here's another view showing a detail of the bay window. And the other project, just uh, literally about one or two blocks away um, in Barcelona in the Aixample is Casa Mila uh, from 1905. And this is a, a full apartment building, unlike uh, Casa Batio, which was smaller and, and was uh, essentially designed for the Batio family with some uh, rentable apartments up above. This is, this is a larger, you know, quarter block apartment building. And the floor plan for this is uh, really expresses that organic architecture and the idea that nothing is rectangular in Gaudi's architecture. Uh, the, the shaded areas here and here, those blobs, these are light courts. Uh, and the, you know, you can see like a stair, stairwell here and here. And then the apartments sort of uh, revolve around these light courts. So and some of them are full size all the way around. Some of them, some areas might have an apartment in the front, an apartment in the back where you have that inner courtyard of the block. The street is along the left and bottom here. And you can see that he, um, he just curves the building around that uh, canted corner that is typical of the Aishampla. And here's a view of it uh, from Kitty Corner. And again, we see the, the canted intersection that was typical of the uh, Aishampla. They're just not two streets intersecting squared off together. They, they clip the, each of the corners. That allows a more open space in between. Uh, that was typical of this uh, urban planning here. And Gaudi takes full advantage of it by just sort of curving the building all the way around and not a straight line on this facade to be found. and a, a, a an exterior view detail that emphasizes the, the fact that there are no straight lines in this. Uh, a very difficult architecture to, you, you can imagine in, to, in today's world with computer modeling, you know, we think of Frank Gehry's work or something like that. Um, you might take this a little bit for granted, but you know, imagine in the early 20th century where there is no computer modeling, everything is done by hand. Uh, somebody has to carve all of this stone and they need to know how to carve it and to match up. You know, you look right here at the bottom of this bay, all of these stones have to match up together. A uh, really, really complex and complicated construction uh, process that requires a lot of hands-on, uh, which is great for the architect, good, uh, good job security for them, uh, but uh, makes a more expensive building. So uh, in part, you know, this style doesn't last because of the economies that are involved here. A few views of the roof deck, which is the most famous of Gaudi's roof decks. Uh, this one is 
bigger building, so it has a more extensive deck. And we see one of the light courts with little dormer windows at the top and more traditional windows you know, from the apartments looking into this light court. And the chimney scapes uh, that are clustered all over are some of his most creative work. And there have been more than one reference or so that uh, George Lucas was inspired by these chimney caps uh, in when he was creating Star Wars in the 1970s. And I, I think I have seen some, some articles where, you know, that's been confirmed. Uh, you know, think of like stormtrooper type helmets here. Uh, pretty, pretty amazing influence uh, and creativity that is up here on this roof deck. And here's a, a view of a larger chimney looking up above uh, of some sort of prehistoric uh, temple god 